One of the things that fundamentally changes after the discovery of the New World is that the countries of Europe are given an enormous advantage. And this is mostly coming off the back of the silver that's discovered by the Spanish. But other countries like France, Britain, and the Netherlands will also find other ways of profiting in the New World. Now, not only does this alter global trading patterns, but it's also going to steadily shift the balance of power, uh, much more so in, in favor of, of Europe. And because European nations are not only exploring the New World, but also exploring the Indian Ocean and the oceans around Asia, new European contacts will be made. Now, historically speaking, East Asia, places like China and Japan, especially China, had historically been the, the center for power and wealth and influence in the world. You can look back to the voyages of Zheng He and how Chinese exploration ships compared to the ships that Columbus sailed on to give you an idea of where China stands in retrospect to Europe in terms of wealth and power. But the transforming uh, economy is going to have some severe consequences with China. Uh, one of them is going to be economic, but the second is that you're going to find that Europeans will have increased interactions in Asia whether that's Europeans who are looking to trade with China and Japan or you know, uh, religious missions, so the Jesuits trying to find new converts overseas. And so the influx of American silver affects Asia, maybe more so than anywhere else. Uh, China at the time had actually been one of the first countries to experience or experiment, excuse me, with paper money. And what they decided was that paper money, yes, it's useful, could have its drawbacks, and that was severe inflation. And so following the, uh, the Wan dynasty of the Mongols, uh, the Chinese had said only silver would be accepted as currency. And in terms of trade goods, the rest of the world had nothing else to offer China. Uh, Zheng He, part of the reason why Zheng He and the Chinese explorations ended was because the world didn't have every, anything that China wanted um, except one thing, right? And there's one thing that the Chinese will accept, and that's silver. So American silver, and by American, we, need, we mean American uh, silver coming from the New World will pour into China and have sort of an, it'll inflate the Chinese economy. It won't actually be all that beneficial. And what comes out is silk and porcelain and spices and all those things that Europeans uh, want. So increased trading missions, uh, increased missionary activity uh, in China. Uh, some examples of this are the Dutch. Now, one of the advantages the Dutch have is that they're not really interested in the religious aspect. They're just looking for pure money. Uh, that's what motivates them. It partly explains why the Dutch are the ones who take over the slave trade, because they're mostly in it for the money and have very little moral obligations uh, to that. Uh, but the Dutch will open up trading missions in China, and as a, a show of respect, and really deference, and to give you an idea of where China and Europe stood in the 1700s, the Dutch will perform the kowtow, which is a ritual um, that is performed to the Chinese emperor. And what it shows, this kowtow, you, you bend down and you place your head on the floor and you bow before the Chinese ambassador or the Chinese emperor, and it's a, a sign that you, know, you acknowledge you are in the weaker position by, by bowing and hitting your head on the ground three times. Um, in terms of religious missions, you will see an increased number of Jesuits in China. Now, initially, the Jesuits are not very successful in finding many converts, but they change their strategy. And what the Jesuits allow for is um, a certain level of uh, Chinese practices to go side, uh, side by side with Christian practices. So one example was that ancestor worship was very prevalent among the Chinese population. It doesn't necessarily hold a central position in the Catholic Church. And so Jesuits, while looking for converts, will allow the Chinese to continue their practice of, of uh, ancestor worship. You know, instead of uh, eating the, the wafer or the cracker as the embodiment of Christ, that will be replaced by rice in China. So the Jesuits are trying to culturally adapt in order to find these converts. And that's in stark comparison to what the Catholic Church and the Jesuits are doing in Europe, especially during the wars of religion, where you know, they are you know, literally killing people who are not following the faith properly. The Inquisition is using punishment and torture. And it's even a little bit different in, in the Americas, where the Spanish especially were somewhat strict with the way that they sought to spread the message. In China, that's not possible. The Chinese are too strong um, at this point uh, for that to happen. 
Now, the Jesuits, they don't find a lot of success, and so they change their strategy, and instead of appealing to the downtrodden and the poor, which actually Christianity is the most effective in doing, some of the very first Christians were the poor Romans and the slaves and, you know, those on the, on the bottom of society. Instead, the Jesuits are going to target the intellectual and political elite in China, and they use some of the technology uh, from Europe to try and impress those individuals. In fact, during the Qing Empire, the Empire, or sorry, the Qing Emperor Kanji will actually become pretty close to converting to Catholicism. And in fact, what you have is a certain level of success among the Jesuits, that the Jesuits also provide for an avenue for European science, you know, these ideas about the scientific revolution and technology to somewhat infiltrate uh, Chinese thoughts. Um, however, Right. With all that being said, however, uh, the Confucian scholar uh, elites and the bureaucrats will be successful in ultimately expelling the Jesuits by 1690. And while you had an avenue then for new ideas to come into Asia, um, you know, on the back of this discovery of the New World and in those successive years, by 1690 the Jesuits will be expelled from uh, from China. But they were successful in converting a certain number of, of individuals there. Um, looking at Japan, you have somewhat of a similar story. Now, Japan is different in that Japan is not controlled by one universal ruler in the same way that China is. In fact, that only happens in the year 1600 when the uh, shogun Tokugawa was able to unite Japan under one solidified state. But rather, what you had were various daimyo, and daimyo were landowners. They were much like the feudal lords in Europe, and the daimyo were the local rulers that were all powerful prior to the arrival or prior to the unification of Japan. And so the Jesuits are going to look to convert these local daimyo, and they serve the same function in Japan as they do in China. However, after unification in 1600, as a way to control the daimyo and control Japan, you will have a series of seclusion decrees that will, on the one hand, ban Christianity from the Japanese islands, uh, force the daimyo to renounce their Christian faith, and you'll have a number of Christians who are tortured and persecuted in China. And this is all part of the Tokugawa regime attempting to solidify their control. Um, and the Japanese will ban any trade from any outside country, especially Europeans. And so ideas regarding the scientific revolution and technological ideas are going to be shielded from arriving in Japan. The Japanese will go so far as to even ban people from leaving Japan. And so it's complete and utter isolation. Both China and Japan will isolate themselves uh, specifically from the European world, but also the outside world. Now, the Japanese have one exception, and that is the Dutch, and they will allow the Dutch to trade in the city of Nagasaki. And the reason why the Japanese allow for a limited amount of trade with the Dutch is because the Japanese rulers want to at least know what's going on in the outside world. They want to hear news. The Dutch, however, they were chosen more than any other European country because they didn't have the religious motivation like Spain and France and some of these other countries. But the Dutch are only allowed to trade once per year. Uh, and so for both of these countries, although there are some limited European contacts, both Japan and China will shut themselves off to any outside and specifically European uh, trade.